Good evening and welcome. I'm Francesca Zambello and thank you for joining this town hall conversation entitled Never Again. I have devoted my life to directing opera and music theater because I believe in the power of the story as a catalyst for conversation and change. To me, a work like The Sound of Music is more than just great songs. It is an opportunity for us to think about the world in which the Von Trapp family lived and to think about the world in which we live. After the horrors of the Holocaust came to light, the international community vowed it would never again allow such atrocities. But when we forget or worse yet, deny our past, we don't have much chance of learning from it. Tonight, I'll be in conversation with two other people who have devoted their lives to making the past live in the present. First, we will hear from Zan Karn, professor of history at Colgate University. He will describe the political and historical context of The Sound of Music. Next, we'll see another perspective from World War II a 10-minute film by Tana Ross, documentary filmmaker and Holocaust survivor. After that, the three of us will come together for a conversation, one that I hope you will join. You can submit your questions and comments at the link provided below. Here's Alexander Karn, professor of history and director of the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Colgate University. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate. Really looking forward to this evening's discussion. I may be reaching for my glasses now and then, my middle-aged eyes and the computer don't always work so well together, but um, I'm glad to be here and it's, um, it's gratifying that a big arts organization like Glimmerglass wants to have this conversation. Um, this question of whether historical inquiry, historical knowledge can help create a better future, I think is an important one. And um, I'm sure I wouldn't be an historian if I didn't think that the possibility existed. Uh, at the same time, I think that um, we should be skeptical when it comes to some of the mantras about uh, studying history to avoid repeating mistakes of the past. Um, I think I agree with Mark Twain, uh, who said that uh, history doesn't really repeat itself, uh, but often it rhymes. And um, I think we're talking about some of those rhyming patterns tonight. Uh, I also just wanna be clear before I start with my presentation, I'm not an expert on the sound of music uh, or on the Von Trapp family. I'm not really uh, someone who has studied the Austrian experience intensively. It's not really my specialty. Um, my research really is more about how people remember and misremember the Second World War and the period leading up to it. And um, that makes me one of these sort of annoying historians um, who enjoys pointing out discrepancies and inaccuracies in historical narratives. I think history uh, as a methodology exists to examine and uh, make sense of some of these misalignments of, of memory. Uh, so I don't want to take away anyone's enjoyment of the, the musical uh, or the film. I think these can be celebrated as really great pieces of art. But it's important that the musical and movie are not confused for historical experience. In the musical, it, one has the impression that Maria comes to the Von Trapp family. Um, there's a, a, you know, a, a relationship that develops with the children and soon with the father and then uh, a marriage and not long after this, um, a Nazi invasion. Um, and that's not really how things happen for the Von Trapps. Maria comes to the villa in, in 1926, which is, um, 12 years before the Nazi annexation of Austria. She and George are married in, in 1927. 
Um, and so there's still an 11 year interval between the marriage and the, um, the very dramatic events in the musical and film that revolve around the, the Nazi takeover of Austria. Um, Maria is 22, I think, when the, um, when the marriage is concluded. George is uh, 25 years older than, than Maria is. Um, they have uh, children of their own soon after the marriage. There are three more children. The total number of untrapped children is, is 10, not seven, like the film uh, and, and uh, musical suggest. But that this time span that gets condensed, it's, it's rehearsed more fully in, in Maria's memoir. Only one third of it is devoted to the events that you see on screen or, or on stage. She has a, a much longer story to tell in the memoir. But most of what she includes there relate to um, the family's domestic life rather than the kind of historical context or, or background. And so let me start by just saying that there are sort of three big phases or intervals of history here to contend with. Um, when Maria comes to the family in 1926, there is a, a liberal democratic republic in Austria. Austria had previously, till the First World War, until the end of the World War, had been part of this large multinational and multi-ethnic empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, it's sometimes called. Um, the Habsburgs fought with the Central Powers in, in the First World War, and they're defeated uh, in 1918, and that leads to the dissolution of this big heterogeneous empire. And out of this big empire, there come uh, a collection of new independent autonomous states. Austria is one of them. And uh, most of these new states will try to um, will try to create new democratic republics. And um, as you'll see, most of these experiments do not uh, succeed, including in the case of Austria. So in 1919, this new Austrian Republic is born, and it's a kind of a rump state. There's a five and a half million people living in the Austrian Republic. There had been more than 30 something million in the empire, but those, uh, those territories are carved out and ceded as a result of the uh, Treaty of St. Germain, uh, signed at the end of the war. And so Austria is this small rump state trying its hand at democracy. The Austrians have had to give up most of their territory. They've had to accept a war guilt clause under the terms of their peace treaty, Treaty of St. Germain. Um, they're going to be made to pay reparations like the Germans were, although um, Austria is never in fact made to pay these. It's introduced under the terms of the treaty in any case. Um, Austria is prohibited under this treaty from coupling with, unifying with Germany, um, despite very strong support for this in both Austria and in Germany. So the Republic is born into circumstances of defeat and unhappiness. And um, this is the beginning of, of some real problems for Austria during this interwar period from 1919 to 1939, including the events in 1938 that you see on stage. Um, and it's interesting that so little of this comes into, uh, comes into the memoir that Maria writes, and so little of it is included in the film and, and, and theatrical versions of the story. This first republic is run via coalition. It's, um, it's headed by a man named Karl Renner, who's a social democrat, a kind of lefty. Uh, but the government is an unpopular one from the very beginning. Uh, and Austrians are struggling during this time with their kind of diminished role in the world. Austria-Hungary, the Habsburg Empire, had been a major global power. This new Austrian Republic is not one of those. And uh, there are, again, many Austrians who really understand themselves to be ethnic Germans, wish to live in a unified German state. This is especially true along the uh, borderlands. And these kinds of um, disappointments and resentments um, they, they are amplified by some of the economic and, and, and political uh, uncertainties of the moment. And what we see here is similar to what we see in Germany, that the economic difficulties give rise to a new radicalization in, in politics. So in 1932, when the global depression is really 
um, at, at its worst, I would say. Um, there are elections in the Austrian Republic and a new chancellor is elected. His name is Engelbert Dolphus. Um, and Dolphus is a right winger, not, a, not necessarily a, a hard or extreme right winger, but a very conservative Christian social party member. And under Dolphus, you see very quickly a kind of unraveling of democratic institutional norms. The parliament um, is disbanded in March 1933, and we see an attack on civil liberties, freedom of the press, um, this kind of thing. There is, a, there is an extremely um, conservative and authoritarian regime that is emerging out of this 1932 election. Um, but there are even more extreme right-wingers uh, to contend with in Austria, too. And in fact, Dolphus, the right-wing chancellor, is assassinated in a, in a, in a coup that, that unfolds in the summer of 1934. Um, he's killed by Austrian Nazis who want a different kind of uh, authoritarian state than the one Dolphus was uh, uh, working to consolidate. And, uh, and so following Dolphus's assassination, he is replaced by a man named uh, Kurt von Schuschnigg. And Schuschnigg um, comes out of this movement called the Patriotic Front. It's a fascist party and a fascist movement. It's called sometimes uh, clerico-fascism because of the ties between the party and the Catholic Church in Austria. In any case, uh, what von Schuschnigg Schuschnigg does very quickly is uh, consolidates the dictatorship that Dolphus had started to um, to create, uh, and so um, the, I'm, I'm telling you this. Um, it's important to understand this progression uh, because these are events that are in the background of Maria and George's story, the story of the Von Traps, but they're not um, they're not presented. Um, clearly or in some cases presented a, at all. Uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that there is a fascist dictatorship in Austria uh, years before the arrival of Adolf Hitler and the German Nazi party in 1938, this very the, the kind of dramatic pinnacle of the movie, the arrival of the Nazis. There is already fascism in Austria prior to this. And the, the von Trapps are, um, they are comfortable within that regime. It's true that um, George is the man who said no to Hitler, um, but before he said no to Hitler, he had said yes to von Schuschnigg, and the von Trapps were living comfortably and securely in what was already a, a fascist dictatorship. Um, it's also important to understand how this story winds down in 1938, and uh, I'll try to get there quickly. The new dictatorship that von Schuschnigg helps to consolidate is sometimes called the Austrian federal state. So after the Republic, we have an Austrian federal state, a, a fascist dictatorship from 1934 until 1938 when the Nazis from Germany take over. Um, it's a conservative authoritarian uh, dictatorship. Uh, there is a glorification of Austrian uh, history, Austrian culture. Um, the Patriotic Front is a movement that emphasizes Austria's traditional Catholic identity, and uh, many of the participants of this movement understand themselves as really the better Germans. Um, they understand themselves culturally, nationally, ethnically as Germans, and see themselves, because of their Catholic uh, culture, as being you know, a, a better kind of German than um, their neighbors to the north. There is anti-Semitic prejudice um, in this Austrian federal state. There is a long history of anti-Semitic prejudice in Austria that goes back into the Habsburg period and earlier. Um, but there are, uh, there are, in 1934 at least, there are no uh, racial laws or doctrines like the ones introduced in Germany in 1935, the Nuremberg um, laws. Uh, but there is a crackdown on political rivals and opponents, both on the left and on the right. Um, this federal state, this dictatorship, is a, is a restrictive and sometimes violent one. Um, 
von Schuschnigg sought an alliance with Italy, with Mussolini. Uh, he thought that Mussolini might help Austria to um, secure its sovereignty, possibly against the threat of a German invasion. And that's an invasion that does finally un unfold in 1938. Hitler is an Austrian. He had wanted a unified German state, one that included uh, both Germany and Austria for a long time. He had asked his generals for an invasion plan already in 1937. Um, Mussolini had uh, run some interference that was helpful to the Austrians um, and, and had helped to stave off that invasion. And this is what you see in the film and, and, and on the stage when the Nazis come to Austria. This is March 1938, the events of the Anschluss. Um, the von Trapps, for reasons that we can maybe talk about tonight, were, were opponents of the German Nazi regime, um, but the, the annexation was embraced in Austria by, by many millions of, of Austrians. That invasion, the annexation that, you, that, that we're talking about now, that's the event that pushes the von Trapps to emigrate, to leave Austria. Um, uh, the circumstances of their emigration are different than what you see in the film. Um, they're not hunted in the, in the abbey, and they don't escape on foot over the Alps. There's no mountain trek. What happens instead is that um, the von Trapps get on a train, um, and they leave Austria, and they go to Italy, where they have some um, choral performances booked. They have launched a career, a new kind of career, as a singing group. Um, they did this after the family lost most of their savings in, in 1934, thanks to a, a, a bank collapse and a very bad um, investment that George uh, had made to try to help a friend. Um, and so they launched a career somewhat reluctantly as singers, and, um, and they're singing already, as you see in the film, um, before, the, uh, before the annexation. And when the annexation comes, when the Anschluss unfolds, there's pressure that is put onto the family to, um, uh, uh, to, to join the movement. And, um, and that is uh, the thing which the Von Trapps resist. Um, and they're able to leave the country and they do that in, um, in the summer of 1938. They go to Italy first, they take a train, they don't escape on foot. Uh, they go to London after this um, and then eventually in the fall of 38, they make their way to the U.S. They're able to stay in the U.S. for a short while, about six months on a visitor's visa. Then they have to leave the country. They go to Scandinavia. They sing another round of concerts there. And they return to the U.S. in the fall of 1939, almost exactly at the moment that World War II um, is, uh, is erupting in Europe. And, and, and their, their experience is not one without difficulty, but they leave Austria at a time and in a way um, that, should, that should encourage us to see some comparisons here. When they can leave Austria, when the doors open for the Von Trapps, those doors are closed for other people. And I think that's important to talk about, particularly uh, at the end of 1938, following what are called the Kristallnacht pogroms. Um, the November 8-9 pogroms in 1939. Um, there are many people uh, desperate to escape the Reich after this event, and most of those, uh, most of those individuals are unable to leave for various reasons. Um, in 1938 and 39, when the von Trapps are also leaving Austria, um, 120,000 uh, Jews are, are, are able to escape the Reich but 185,000 Jews are also unable to do so during the same period. And when the war begins in September of 1939, um, only 18 or maybe 20,000 of these individuals are able to escape. The rest are, are trapped and their endings would be very bad in, in many cases. Um, they're trapped in the clutches of a, of a genocidal dictatorship. Um, and so I think one thing we can talk about a little bit tonight maybe is this kind of contrast, the relative ease with which the Von Trapps are able to escape their difficulties while at the same time other groups uh, find themselves confronted with 
um, very serious obstacles that make this kind of emigration impossible. Um, so I know that's a lot to throw at everyone, and uh, I hope that we can return to some of these themes and questions in tonight's question and answer session. Thank you very much. This is my story. I was born in Germany, in Berlin. For seven years, the Nazis had been in power. They had special names for us, for Jewish babies. My name was Tana. One day, my mother left me. I never saw her again. Soon, everyone else was gone. They sent me to Theresienstadt. In the camp, I found my grandmother. My grandmother says that we must never be sent east, because the east is death, Auschwitz and Birkenau. When they come for me, she gives her potatoes. I leave my friends, and then she hides me. You see, they have already taken her daughter. She will not let them get the child. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sieben, acht, neun, zehn, elf, zwölf, dreizehn, vierzehn, fünfzehn, sechzehn, siebzehn. Play with the Czech children. They may have a better chance. Jedna, dvi, tři, čtyři. I'm three. I'm four. I'm nearly five years old. I'm invisible. No one will catch me. Shh. Then the Russians arrived, and the war was over. My grandmother and I were taken to Sweden. There, my great uncle and aunt would be waiting for us. Everybody huddled around whispering. They were curious to see the survivors. Especially the miracle child.
My new home was filled with music. My uncle was a conductor. He had many Swedish friends. Don't tell. Don't tell. We don't ever want to know. Ever. Promise? Promise? I knew how to keep silent. Today is another day, my aunt would say. We must forget the past. You're only a child. You're too young to ask so many questions. My grandmother, too, said nothing. Time went by. People would ask, what kind of name is Tana? So exotic. And I would invent. I didn't want to be exotic. I wanted to be just like them. I had become a Swedish child. I was eight. I was twelve. I was twenty years old. Yet I was still invisible, still the best at hiding. So I left. My uncle and my aunt saw me to the station. They gave me a package. They said they were sorry. That life wasn't so simple. That before I was too young to understand. in November 39. My mother, my mother wrote to you. Dear aunt, our attempts to leave have come to nothing. Nobody wants us. Not Chile, not Argentina, not Shanghai, not Denver, USA. We had hoped it would work out with Sweden so we could be safe with you. My dear aunt, we are trapped. I know you have tried, but others have got the visa. Others without an aunt and an uncle already there. November 1940. They are making me call my baby Tana. They're changing the names of all Jewish children. They're taking away the people will soon be coming for us. You cannot let us be forgotten. My mother was taken to Auschwitz in 1942. So now I had the letters, my dowry, a bridge to the past. Still, I didn't speak. I couldn't. Mm 
life isn't so simple. It took me 50 years to tell this story. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's so beautiful and so moving. I've seen it several times and it, it just, it really, it goes to my heart. Um, so welcome if you're just joining us. I'm Francesca Zambello. Uh, this is Tana Ross, documentary filmmaker, uh, and Zan Karn, who gave us a fascinating lecture before. Um, I'm so thrilled to have you all. Just a, a few words about Glimmerglass and, and how we are here tonight in our town hall series. Uh, these series are really to speak about combining the issues of the works that we would normally be producing with speakers and thinkers. Uh, and so, of course, we would have done The Sound of Music this season, and this program was to accompany it and to bring dialogue about World War II and the atrocities of the Holocaust. Uh, to, to put the work in a perspective. So uh, we're going to have some uh, dialogue, some questions. You can send us questions or comments in the link below. I've gotten some right now. I just I want to start with a, a, a comment from AL uh, just to say thank you. Uh, I survived the Holocaust because a Dutch Indonesian family lived in the Netherlands and their Indonesian Muslim nanny risked their lives to save a nine-month-old Jewish baby. Sadly, my sisters were hidden with a different family and were betrayed. I am heartened that whenever I share the story of my family with young people, they readily take the lessons of choosing between good and evil to heart. Let's hope that that's always the case. Um, Tana, um, people are asking, why did it take 50 years for you to make silence and to speak out? It was 50 years after the war and in Stockholm, it was decided to, to celebrate it by celebrating the children of the region Stadt. And uh, since I was one of the hundred that survived of the 15,000 children that were under the age of 15 that was deported to Theresienstadt, uh, all together, there were, there were 144 deported people deported to the camp, and 33,000 died in the camp, and 88,000 were deported to Auschwitz. But of the 15,000 people, uh, children, I was one of the 100 that survived. And since they were dedicating the, uh, the uh, whole event to the children, to the to the children of Theresienstadt, I decided to do something to do. Uh, so I uh, decided to do a tone poem because many of my family were musicians. And uh, I called a friend in New York, Noah A., who was a, uh, a composer and a writer. And I told her the story, and together we, we put together the tone poem, poem. And we did perform it in Stockholm at the 50th anniversary after the, the uh, war. And it was uh, successful. And they asked me to do it again, which I didn't want to do. And so I met with my friend, Orly, who is a filmmaker. And she suggested, why don't I make a film about it instead? And that's how it came about. And how did the use of animation come about? Uh, that was yet described as a documentary, so I think it's an interesting 
juxtaposition. That was Orly's idea, and I think she was the first um, person to use uh, animation in a documentary. It has been done after two words, and I think it works very well. Oh, it's, it's it's beautiful. It it it's so poetic. Um, and Zan, you you talked about history not repeating itself, but rhyming. Uh, I love that. Do you think that there are present day rhymes with the situation in Austria or other parts of the world now? And um, okay, we're going to go right there. That's it. we're going <laughs> to go. I know that's a little heavy. Um, no, I mean, that's uh, well, understandable. You, and you you talk about immigration and uh, yeah. how they had an easy path and yeah, you know everything we're doing now. And then Tana talking about immigrating to America, a very different mm -hmm. situation and her parents' situation. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about the Von Trapps for these past few weeks, uh, more more recently than in my entire life, I suppose. But, um, and, and you know, in, in a way, I worry that, that I, I've been too hard on them in the in the lecture that I that I provided, um, I, I think it, it is certainly true that their story of immigration is a is an easier one um, and an instructive one than than we than we would see in many other cases. Uh, but but I don't I don't mean to suggest that you know there is something nefarious in the family history. But in in, in response to your question about sort of rhyming and um, uh, contemporary uh, concerns. I, I, I mean, I, I think in, in the interwar period in Austria and Germany and elsewhere, um, there, is this, there is this process of radicalization and polarization of social atomization um, that um, provides a kind of uh, opening for really dangerous and illiberal forces and, and politics. And of course, I, I, I worry and wonder about what we're living through today in the United States, around the world. Um, there are really you know, great um, historians who focus only on this question, on whether you know, fascism is back or in what form is it back. Um, at Yale, Tim Snyder and um, Jason Stanley at, at NYU, Ruth Ben Giat, uh, Federico Finkelstein at uh, at the New School. These are really top flight historians who have had recently a lot to say about the rhyming patterns and um, what interventions they might call for right now. Uh, I, I thought your point about uh, von Schusnig. Uh, and his uh, what makes fascism acceptable in one way, respect and un unacceptable in another, and how the von Trapps were comfortable with that. I mean, it's a it's a survival question, isn't it? It and is. Then um, I, I agree that it is. I mean, the um, the von Trapps, you know, when they leave in 1938, they realize what kind of danger this new regime presents and. The family has, you know, has stood up to the to the German Nazis in several direct re in several direct ways. They have refused to fly the Nazi flag, which you see in the musical and in the film. Um, but George has uh, a, a naval career in his background. He's been asked to take a, a new naval commission and to re-engage with the with the German uh, uh, naval apparatus. He refuses to do that. Um, and, um, and in the third case, the family is asked to sing for Adolf Hitler, which they refused to do. Um, but they had sung previously for von Schuschnigg. And, um, and I, I think you're right that there is, um, there is an aspect of sort of survival and necessity to the way the family conducts itself during that period of the federal state, 1934 to 1938. Uh, and in 1938, I think what they probably recognize is that these kinds of accommodations and survival measures can only be extended so far before they are a kind of you know, active complicity. Right, uh, and, and that is, a, I think, a very complex thing that's part of our situation right now with uh, immigration and our refugee policy. And I was thinking about that as Tana, you were talking about 
going to Oslo and, and shutting out so much of life's history before with your the image of you with your grandmother. Stockholm. To Stockholm, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The von Trapps went to okay. Oslo. Well, yeah, Scandinavia was... did a good job yeah. with everybody. Um, yeah. to a point. Um, you know, I found that I found that incredibly moving. Uh, Stockholm just must have it must have felt like a completely surreal world then. Absolutely it was, yeah. What was it like? Well, the, the first things I remember was the food, how good it was. And it mm -hmm. was clean. And uh, I think the worst memories for me, for me during the war was that it was the lies and the smell of the disinfectant. And uh, uh, so I came into a very comfortable, beautiful surrounding. And uh, that felt good, yeah. Right, I, I think there are so many, the stories, what I love is the, this uh, in juxtaposition of your film with something like The Sound of Music and how this, whether it's a story or a novel or a play um, of this period, I'm, I'm curious what has stuck with either of you in terms of ways of interpreting history, because often these things are, more fact, more fiction than fact, but what maybe has made some resonance for each of you? Well, you know, the, the film is not exactly the story. Um, but I was uh, uh, hidden by family in the Mannheim, by Christian family who had lost their, their sons in the war. Their house was burned down. And uh, then I was in the in orphanage, as my old family was gone by now. And somehow I ended up with my grandmother in Theresienstadt. So that was the story. And then fr from there on, the, the story is about the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Zan, do you think that we have fictionalized Theresienstadt or that America did at that time in terms of it being a, you know, a place that perhaps really the truth wasn't being let out completely? No. Um, a couple of things strike me about Tana's film, more than a couple, but um, what, what comes to mind, you know, immediately for me is the kind of double aspect of silence in that film and in history more generally. Silence, on the one hand, we, we associated it with, with, with reverence and with you know, tranquility and, and peace. There is a, a kind of relief that we seek in silence. Um, but at the same time, you know, we associate silence with, with complicity and with cover-up. Um, and, and, and in the film, it's, it's, you know, it's very moving to hear what pressure, you know, Tana was exposed to, to, to keep certain memories and experiences submerged, buried and silent. Um, you know, when, when, when told as a child, don't tell, don't tell, we don't want to know. I mean, I think, you know, what, what is an especially good connection, I think, between the, the Tana's work and, and, and the, and the sound of music is this, question of, of silence and how, how much we want to know to fill that silence and, and, and which version of history we want to uh, inject into that silence. Um, silence, you know, for many people is a kind of comfortable and preferable state, but it, it also has an intense personal and collective costs. And, um, you know, I think that um, in the context of the Holocaust and and today as well, we should be thinking about who bears the costs of these silences. Um, so, you know, I would say that there is, there is no account, you know, that every account of the past is something partial, that every recollection leaves things out. And certainly that's true in the case of the Long Traps and the memoir that Maria wrote and the, the art that's based on it. And Tana has said that her film is not the whole story. I think that's that's an, an inevitable part of, of, of memory and history is that it is never 
it is never comprehensive. And then we have this very big question about what to do about all that remains, about the silence right. that is there and how and when we choose to fill it and with which, uh, with, with which methods, whether it is artistic, whether it is historiographical. And I see these um, as being essentially complementary. Yeah, I think so speaking, it, sorry, yeah. Tana, go ahead. No, I think also for me as a child in Sweden and later on, I just wanted to be sweet, Swedish. I didn't want to be foreign. I don't, didn't want to be Jewish. I didn't want to be different. I just wanted to be, sweet, to be Swedish. Mm -hmm. So that was one reason. And then the pressure from the family and, uh, was another thing to keep it, to, to keep it secret. Uh, then I, when I came to, to the United States, there were so many Jews, and they talked so much about the Holocaust, Holocaust that I didn't need I, to speak about it until uh, this um, commemoration 50 years after the war in Stockholm. And uh, it was particularly for the children and their art and their poetry uh, that was celebrated. And then I felt I should talk because I was one of the few, few children that survived. Um, I have a question, Tana, that's come in about uh, the film. Uh, if you could speak about the image of what appears to be a Shylock character turning into a rat in the Santa Lucia scene in the film. Oh, that is the, the ugly Jewish, even the, the, the rat, the dirty rat, the dirty Jew. Uh, it, it, <laughs> There was in the old days in Sweden in the Santa Lucia uh, celebration a Jew with a, with a uh, money bag behind him. And mm -hmm. I don't know what he ce celebrated and uh, what it meant, but to me it was like a Jew. And that uh, rat was the same kind of image I, I had of a dirty Jew that was, was not wanted anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If it makes I, sense. <laughs> I, and I, I think it does make sense. I think um, the film is full of these very beautiful uh, poetic images, which immediately call up things to us, and that's why I think I found the animation so successful. I mean, you know, the railroad car, and then you talking about yeah. being the railroad station. I mean, these sort of through lines that are part of our. Uh, sort of received collective con uh, collective consciousness about World War II and about the Holocaust and something that you know which is why we call this series never again that you know people don't forget I mean I find it I find it shocking they don't teach the Holocaust in many schools anymore in the United States yeah. I teach was thinking you. Oh, I'm sorry please Tana, please no no I uh, go to Berlin uh, once a year to a school where I talk about uh, the, the Second World War, the Holocaust. And that's very uh, big, big for me to do it. I still speak uh, German. I made, I made a book about uh, the poetry and the pictures of the, the, that the children made in the uh, in Theresienstadt. It was an incredible artist uh, named Frida Dick and Brandi who uh, taught the children art. In two years, uh, she was taken to Auschwitz. It's, uh, but before she left, she saved 4,000 drawings and poems in two suitcases. And uh, that is a, uh, an extraordinary memory of uh, what of how children felt about, about being separated from their parents, and separated from it, being in a strange place. And, and, and that's very simplifying. That's wonderful that you do that. What were you gonna say, Zan? I was just thinking at, at Colgate University where I, where I teach, we offer a course um, in the history department on uh, war and Holocaust. It's an intermediate level course and it is, mm -hmm. 
um, it is always fully enrolled and it is always, there is always extraordinary demand for that class, a waiting list normally. Um, uh, and it, it doesn't matter who teaches it, by the way, it's, it's always in demand. Um, and that's, um, that's all I've always found that curious because the, the subject matter is so, you know, dark and heavy. Um, I wonder about what, what exactly students want from this course, but I'm normally sort of buoyed also by that, by that fact of the, uh, of this existent curiosity and what we might be able to do with it. Um, and, and it's a great honor and privilege for me, you know, to, to teach and share some of that, uh, history with students and, um, we, you know, we do our best to unpack and understand these events. One thing I, I, I guess I would hasten to add, though, I, I think is important to sort of stir in, in, into the pod is that there is still a difference, I think, between this kind of memory work and the, the, the activism and policy that would realize a principle like never again. Um, it is important to teach and, and learn the past. That's what, that's what I've devoted myself to professionally. But I'm, I'm cognizant, and, and others, others should be too, I think, of the difference between uh, a chorus on the Holocaust and actual you know, policies and instruments of government and diplomacy that could make a difference in the real world where there are you know, dangers of, of genocide again. Um, and so you know, I think it's something I, I try to impress on students, and I think maybe for our audience tonight, it's an important thing to think about, is whether or to what extent this memory work um, can be the prelude to the, the the sort of messier political work that 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 would that would allow us to to make a principle like never again um, to, to give a principle like that some some teeth. Well, I think we're in a complex time, and you know certainly in this country, and I think that the questions that we ask about uh, Germany and the Holocaust are certainly questions that not in this forum right now, but certainly are things that I would hope that our audience uh, is reflecting on and things that certainly issues uh, as it pertains to us, I think of, you know, black culture matters and how we will go forward presenting that at Glimmerglass, uh, because that is certainly something that is important to us. Um, but I do think that all everything that you're talking about, both of you and have shown us is, is again, a way to think about the past and what it means today and how to, how we incorporate it today. Uh, and I, I surely, Tana, can only think, you know, when you say you forget so much or ask to forget so much, but you, can, you can't forget these. It's all part of the fabric. Yeah. Um, I, I do my activism, I think, through the documentary films that I do. It's not about the Holocaust, but it is social, about social issues that I care about. And I give you an example. One of the films we did, it was about an African-American Jew, also gospel singer. Uh -huh. He was the uh, music director, or he is the music di director in the church, in the Baptist church. She also teaches Hebrew in a uh, big congregation in New Jersey. And he lives in both worlds and he's accepted by rabbis and ministers. And these are the kind of, and, and there's a lot of music in it because he sounds like Mahela Jackson. And uh, so these are the things I do through the documentary that I, so I don't talk so much much about the Holocaust, but I try to use my experience in the films or in the photographs that I take and so on. So, well, I hope that we can way. gather together uh, certainly next season, and I would love to make that documentary part of our season as well. Um, I really want to thank you both for being here with us tonight. We have uh, a lot coming up for our audiences the rest of the summer. We will continue on Thursdays at 5.30 and then it stays live on uh, Instagram and on Facebook and on our website. Uh, so there is a lot coming up about Jungle Book. We have a program coming which will feature Indian culture and Indian dance. We have Ryan McKinney coming up with Schubert songs. 
We have another town hall coming up with Sister Helen Prejean, um, and to, uh, who will be speaking about uh, her work regarding the death penalty. She'll be interviewed by uh, Dr. Teresa Miller, who is the head of Chief Officer of Diversity for SUNY University uh, and a professor in criminal prosecution. So we have a lot of other programs coming up. You can check them all out on our website. Um, and before we go tonight, I also want to not only thank our wonderful guests here tonight, Tana and Zan, but also to thank uh, the Gladys Kriebel Delmas Foundation for a grant for all of this programming. Um, and to close, of course, we're going to have some music. We need to have music here from the Glimmer Glass Festival. We wish we were giving it to you live. Um, we are going to hear uh, a selection played by one of our music staff. Kirill Kuzmin. Um, he is going to play something from Prokofiev's ballet, Romeo and Juliet. Um, the selection is called Father Lorenzo. This work was commissioned for the Kirov in 1935 and did not make it on stage until 1940 in the Czech, well, I would say the Czech Republic, then Czechoslovakia. Um, and that is a story unto itself. And I hope and pray one of these days that we will do a Prokofiev opera but for now, stick with us on Thursdays at 5.30. Tana and Zan, thank you. I know our audience is applauding. Thank you very, thank very you. much for being thank us. You. Thank you and for the over, opportunity. And over to Kirill, who is a member of our music staff. He is a native of Russia and is now has, uh, is an, has immigrated to the United States and lives in Texas. So over to Kirill. Thank you.